Ahoy! Hello! Welcome along. It's a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name is Dan. Thank you so much for being there. Thank you for joining in, coming along on this mission through the universe to discover all the science secrets that are lurking around the solar system. This week, we'll hear all about the coral reefs, how they are the lungs of the ocean, and why they're so important for life on Earth, and chat to a genius marine biologist called David Smith. 90% of all coral reefs will disappear from our planet in the next 20 years, unless we do something about it. So they're critically important for us, they're critically endangered, and now we have found a way where we can actually rebuild coral reefs underwater. Also, we'll take one last trip to deep space high with Professor Pulsar, the smartest school in the solar system, to talk about whether pets can ever go into space. How about this one? I think it will be right up their street. How many people have been to space before? Expert identified. Connecting. My name is Libby Jackson. I work for the UK Space Agency. Hi, Libby. Do you happen to know how many people have been to space before? And I've got your questions to ask as always. This week, they are on why our fingers go so wrinkly and pruney in the bath and whether there is anything inside the moon. It's all on the way in a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's kick things off with this week's Science in the News. A huge mission is underway to map all of the species that are found in the UK and Ireland, every single one. Scientists want to know what the DNA is in every single organism around. All the plants, all the animals, all the fungi, everything, everything, everything. They guess there's over 70,000 species and experts are going to track, find and map every single species also another map the Gaia telescope is in space by Europe we put it there and it's building the biggest record of light in the sky it's trying to pinpoint all of the stars the asteroids and the galaxies that it can see now it's already mapped 2 billion things and now it's trying to find out more about what those things are and finally this is huge news scientists have received a radio signal from space experts in China have picked up what might be a message from another galaxy. You might remember at the start of the year we did our mission transmission where we sent a radio show to space. Who knows? Maybe this is some aliens getting back in touch, wanting a shout out, saying they're locked in. It has been detected in a galaxy three billion light years away, which means it was sent three billion light years ago, which means the galaxy is 18 sextillion miles away. If we want to go there, better head off quickly, right? It's time for the last in our Professor Halleck's Map of Medicine series. We've been following this for the last few weeks or so. Uh, Halleck's, with his best mate, his genius helper, nurse, nanobot, they've been looking inside your body, looking at what makes you ill, what makes you sick, and then who makes you better again. Uh, In the series, we've looked at everything from your mouth, your nose, your ears, your lungs, your heart, your feet, your hands, your, your arms... This week, it's all about what goes into a first aid kit. Some of the first steps that you need to get better are in a first aid kit. And he has some top safety tips too. Professor Halex's Map of Medicine. Was it that blooming bee? (laughs) Oh, you've been stung on the schnoz. Professor, Professor, get the first aid kit. With you in a minute. Just adding in some medical machinery to the map of medicine, an MRI and a microscope. Stop fiddling. I need the first aid kit. Where did you leave it? It's on the windowsill. Got it. There's a frog in this box! Where are the cream and plasters? Oh yes, I needed a box for Fabian, the French forest-dwelling frog. He's very rare, you know. Here's the first aid stuff. It's in the teapot. Don't you know that first aid is more important than a flaky old frog? You're right. I'm sorry. Why don't you give us the clinical crunch on first aid whilst I get some cream on Body's nose? Happy 
happy to. <laughs> Clinical crunch. <laughs> Whoops. Right. If you hurt yourself when at home, you probably won't need to see the doctor. First aid is a way to treat minor injuries like stings, grazes and bruises. Ouch! And to do that, every house should have a first aid box. Normally, these are green with a white cross on the front, so they're easy to find. Does your house have one? Do you know where it is? Do you know what's inside? Let's load up the map of medicine to find out more. Opening the map of medicine. Now, first aid boxes are all there to do the same thing, to help treat minor injuries. But the contents aren't always exactly the same. Some things are always sensible to include. First thing, plasters. Now, plasters are something I'm sure you've seen before. They're sticky bandages you can put onto cuts and grazes to keep the dirt out. But before you put on a plaster... Stop! All cuts and grazes need to be dirt free. Running the grazed bit under a tap can remove loose mucky bits. But if it needs cleaning, antiseptic wipes can help. So they're worth having in your kit. The next thing you'll find in the box might make you think of mummies and the pyramids. Bandages. They're strips of fabric that can be used on their own to support hurt joints or with sterile pads to dress larger cuts. The triangular shaped bandages are just the thing to make a sling for her arms. They're made of fabric too, although you could use a scarf in an emergency. Don't forget the gloopy stuff. Always fun, a bit of gloop, I reckon. Yes, you may find creams in the box, but they're not for fun. Antihistamine creams help soothe rashes and stings, just like bodies. And antiseptic creams can soothe grazes too. What about medicines? Have you done them yet? Medicines that stop things hurting are called painkillers, also useful to have in a first aid box. But remember kids, <coughs> never touch medicines, get your paws off. It can be dangerous if you have too much medicine, so grown-ups need to be in charge of measuring it out. It's no good just having a lovely box of plasters and cream though. It's worth making your home a safe place for everyone who's in it. Some things that keep us safe are big things. Uh-oh, sounds like I burnt my toast. Only kidding, that noise was a smoke alarm. And you should definitely have one in your home and test the batteries regularly. But the other things you can do to stay safe are little things. Here's my top three tips. Oh, go on then. You can introduce them, Fabian. You can be our first aid frog. He says slow down, especially when you're on the stairs. Lots of children end up hurt due to falls on staircases, so take it one step at a time. Tip 2. Tidy up your toys. Keeping floors clutter-free can help prevent falls, and if you have younger brothers or sisters, it will stop them putting small things like marbles into their mouths, which could give them a tummy ache or even choke them. What's our last tip, Fabian? Oh, good one. Stay well away from hot things. Grown-ups should make sure they're safely out of bounds. Things like kettles, toasters and matches can cause serious burns or even death. Just leave them alone. They're rubbish to play with anyway. Let's have a quick disgusting detail, nurse. There's just time before we go. Disgusting detail. Oh, I love a good disgusting detail. Now, first aid boxes haven't always been around, but throughout history people have had their own remedies and cures for their aches and pains, mainly because even 80 years ago, doctors were really only for the rich. <laughs> but some of the home remedies were, well, a little weird. An old Irish remedy for earache was to boil a cockroach in oil and shove the bug in your lug hole. <laughs> And a remedy for a cold was to share your bed with your dog. They believed the dog would catch the cold and you would be cured. Not much fun for the poor dog, though. Well, I hope you all stay safe until the next time you can join me to explore the map of medicine. Professor Hullock's map of medicine is produced by Fun Kids with support from the Wellcome Trust. Let's get to
to your questions then. If you've got anything sciencey that you want answered on this show, you need to leave it as a review for us over on Apple Podcasts. I see it, I do the dig in, and then hopefully, fingers crossed, I give you a shout out on the show. Uh, Alfie and Elodie are in Jersey, and they want to know why fingers go wrinkly in the bath. Have you ever noticed that with yours? You've been having a soak for a little for quite a long time. Your fingers grow, go all pruney, don't they? They look a little bit like an alien. Well, here's what happens inside your fingers. Your blood vessels, they're the things that move blood around your body, uh, they shrink when they get hot. Your brain sends a message to make them do this. And because there's less blood in your fingers, it makes them thinner, and that makes the skin fold, and it makes them wrinkly. Now, experts don't exactly know why this happens with the blood vessels in your fingers. They think we've evolved this skill to make us better at grabbing and gripping things underwater. It gives us a bit more purchase when we need to hold on to things. The wrinkles can help it stick to us. And scientists think that's why it happens, Alfie and Elodie. Thank you for the question. Uh, here's one from Brody, who is 10, who wants to know, does the moon have a core? Yes. Experts think it does have a core. We've not drilled down into it, but they think it is 300 miles wide. And they think that is the inner core, which is made of solid iron. Pretty much one element, just solid iron. Now, outside of that is a hotter liquid iron core, the outer core. Now, that's another 200 miles wide. So all in all, the core inside the moon is massive and it's full of iron, Brody. Thank you for the question. If there's something you would like answered on this show, on the Fun Kids Science Weekly next week, leave it as a review for us on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, there is a brand new idea that's around, and it's a way to save the world's coral reefs. We can find out more with marine scientist Professor David Smith. Thank you for being there, David. Thanks, Dan. Lovely to be here with you. We hear so much about coral reefs, but I'm not 100% sure what they are. Someone said once they are the lungs of the world, something like that. Can you, can you tell us more? Yeah, I think maybe a good way of thinking about it, Dan, is that they're the sort of rainforests of the ocean. So coral reefs are made up of lots of different animals, but the, the base of a coral reef is made up of a small animal, which has a special relationship with um, seaweed, actually. And together they produce these big, big, complex physical structures that other types of animals call home. So on a coral reef, you can have lots of different species of fish, you have species of turtle, lots of different um, what we would call invertebrates like crabs and the like. So about a quarter of all marine life in the oceans are found on coral reefs. They're really important. And why do they need saving? What's going on down there? Well, unfortunately, Dan, although they're very important for biology and for us as people, about a billion people depend on coral reefs for food and income, they are critically threatened. We think, um, and the latest science tells us, that up to 90% of all coral reefs will disappear from our planet in the next 20 years unless we do something about it. So they're critically important for us, they're critically endangered, and now we have found a way where we can actually rebuild coral reefs underwater. And that's what we're trying to do as part of this program, actually rebuild a coral reef. Now, I want to get to the good news in a little bit. Just very quickly, one last question about the bad news. What, like, what could go wrong? So you say that within 20 years, they could all be gone. So in 21 years' time, if there's no coral reefs, how does that affect us and the world? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, there's lots of stuff that is impacting on coral reefs. Climate change is one of the biggest problems that we face. But we're also, unfortunately, in the past, we've used different types of techniques to fish coral reefs, and that has been unsustainable and damaging. So really destructive practices. And I think probably people didn't realize how valuable and how sensitive they are. The way it will affect us would be quite simply that the very health of the ocean itself will suffer. We don't know what the consequences will be for the entire of the oceans, but if we remove a quarter of all its species, there's likely to be big changes in fish populations and 
the amount of fish in the ocean and its capacity to function. So it's a, it's, it would be a terrible thing to uh, see then. There are, you know, there is hope, but it's a very urgent problem that we need to deal with. I remember being in Australia and going diving in the Great Barrier Reef. And I remember first getting into the water and then kind of spinning a left just around the nose at the front of the boat and then seeing it, seeing it in front of you. And it's like colors that your eyes can't even describe. What's it like for you, David? You're a diver going into these like magical kingdoms. It's like something from a Disney movie, but all the time. Dan, it's just a privilege of a lifetime to dive on a reef. You know, the first time I dived on the reef, I was very young and I've been diving every day. Well, not every day, but you know, a lot since over eight to 9,000 times I've dived on coral reefs. It's a magical system. You know, you can get close to reef and find new species doing really funky stuff and, and living together and finding unique ways to live together on a very small scale. Or you can swim off a reef and look left and right and see it stretching, you know, miles into the distance. They're, they're true kingdoms underwater. And again, more species there than anywhere else on the planet. So it's a really busy, it's a really noisy environment and it's extremely colourful and they're extremely important for us. It is noisy. Yeah. I, that's the first thing that you noticed, I remember, is hearing like the, it was almost like the chomping yes. of the fish on the coral. <laughs> yeah. You know, and one of the, one of the fun things actually is there's, there's this big species of parrotfish. It's called a parrotfish because it has like a beak, like a parrot. And they can be really large. And if you follow them, you can see them crunching up the coral and when they, um, they then produce clean sand. And that's important for beaches. So it's a really noisy place. And a lot of the science we've done actually recently is trying to understand what makes that sound. And we can actually use the sound of the reef to, to measure its health. Um, so, yeah, noisy reef. And when you dive on a, on a, on a degraded reef or a damaged reef, it's deathly quiet. It's grey and it's really eerie. So the sound is really important. It plays lots of different roles. So we've sold how brilliant these <laughs> things are, but I guess for, uh, for people listening to dive on them, to experience them in the future, they're going to need to be around. How are you planning to save these things, David? Yeah. Well, we started um, a program uh, a long time ago, actually, but we really kicked it off in grand fashion in 2021 when we spelt the words hope by planting corals back into these damaged systems. It's a bit like planting trees in a sense. You can get corals which have broken off in nature naturally, and you can put them back onto a reef to regrow what is the tree's equivalent to a forest. And that's what we're doing in many locations around the world, in, in those areas where we know are really important and are likely to stand the test of time. And we're regrowing the coral. You regrow the coral, then all the fish come back and the, and the reef comes alive. If you do that on a big enough area, that reef will start to reseed other reefs and get people excited about the fact that we can make this positive change in our lifetime. So it's all about regrowing and rebuilding a coral reef. Amazing. And I know that you want adults to get involved with this. It's such a shame. It's such a shame that, that not everyone can. But just if, if you know, if a mum or dad is out there, wants to be a hope ambassador, what do they need to do? Tell us more. Well, first thing I think is now that we should be infusing the next generation of marine biologists, which are probably most of your listeners, Dan, and I'd encourage people, uh, uh, children listening to get excited about this amazing uh, place that you'll get to visit hopefully in the future. But the adults um, listening, they are more than welcome to apply to um, our ambassador program, which is really a sort of uh, an opportunity of a lifetime to join our coral reef restoration teams in the Maldives, where we've started our new program um, get trained for a week in the UK on coral reef restoration, then fly out to the Maldives and, and actively restore and rebuild the coral reef with us and the local community in the Maldives, and also a Maldivian ambassador who they'll be twinned with and learn about what it's like living on the reef and some of the problems that they face. So there's a real opportunity for, for guys to actually, an, an aspiring ocean conservationist, if you like, to actively engage in the um, in coral reef restoration practices. And that's open to everyone. You don't have to be a marine biologist to do this. You just need to be a very enthused, passionate individual who can swim, obviously, um, who wants to do, make a difference in the world. Amazing. Well, listen, Professor David Smith, thank you so much for joining us. 
Absolute pleasure, Dan. Thank you very much. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan, where we take a look at some of the meanest, some of the cruelest things in the universe. This week, it's all about the best hunter in the world. And it might not be who you think. You might think that uh, a ferocious lion or a snapping shark is the world's best predator, but get this. The world's best hunter is actually a dragonfly. They've got a long tail, they've got four wings, they've got two huge eyes. They're normally quite brightly coloured. Now, in insects, when something is brightly coloured, normally uh, that's to attract them over, to make them appear like a flower, to make them enticing. Now, dragonflies live all over the world, uh, except from on Antarctica, at the South Pole, and scientists have found they are the world's best hunters. They catch more than 95% of the prey that they target, which is twice as successful as a great white shark. It's four times as good as a lion. That means if you're another insect, a mosquito or a fly, an ant or a bee, there's very little chance of you getting free if a dragonfly wants you for dinner. It's got these huge eyes which give a massive view of the world and it perches on a leaf quite high waiting for prey to fly nearby. It's got lightning quick reactions. A special neuron detects the tiniest of motions and movements from its prey and kind of without realising it'll adjust, it'll move, it'll spin, it'll flick. They can fly at 60 miles an hour. They've got strong arms and wings which catch the prey and when it gets something there's almost no chance of it escaping and that means the best hunter in the world, the beast that's going straight on our Dangerous Dan list is the dragonfly. It's time for another trip to Deep Space High this week. We've been going there for a little while now, taking the ship up to the smartest school outside of the solar system. On Deep Space High, you get a brilliant view of the solar system, the galaxy around us, and even right here, down to planet Earth. This week, we're catching up with Professor Pulsar. He is the teacher at Deep Space High, and he's talking about whether pets can ever go to space. Professor Pulsar's Space Explanation Service with support from the UK Space Agency. Somewhere between Polaris and Ursa Minor, just a glint in the night sky to the naked eye. But look a little closer and you will see it is Professor Pulsar's exploration craft, the Intrepid 5, piloted by trusted Captain T. Tory. While the pupils of Deep Space High take their school holidays, Pulsar is roaming the universe to explore the most dastardly difficult mysteries of space and broadcasting his findings back to the planets. It can only be another episode of Professor Pulsar's Space Explanation Service. Captain! Captain! Captain T. Tory! Where are you? Captain! Oh, sorry, Professor. Didn't hear you. I was listening to some music by my favourite band, the Quasar Chiefs. They're ace. I'm sure they are, T-Tory, but that doesn't help us with solving any more space questions. Why don't you see if you can find us another fantastic question? I could dispatch the data scoops and see if I can troll something up. Yes, but hurry up. We want to see what is out there. Here comes one now, Professor. Can pets go to space? Oh, good one. Computer, I think we need some expert help on this one. Do you think you could sniff someone out? Target acquired. Centering in on Swindon, England on planet Earth. It looks like somewhere called the UK Space Agency. Loading file. The UK Space Agency is the organisation that represents the UK space industry to the rest of the world. They are involved in a huge range of projects from across the UK, including getting the next Britain into space, Tim Peake. He will launch next year on a mission called Principia. These chaps seem to know their stuff. Who exactly are we speaking to? My name's Andrew Koo. I work for the UK Space Agency. My job title is Human Spaceflight and Microgravity Programme Manager. And Andrew, do you know if pets can go into space? They can. I'm not sure you'd want to take your pet to space because it's not a very nice environment necessarily for an animal to be in. In fact, we launched animals before we launched humans into space just to test. There's Laika, the Russian dog, was a, a celebrity in the Soviet Union. Iran recently have been launching monkeys into space. So there's no physical reason not to launch animals into space, but there's always an ethical dimension to these things. So you'd want to think long and hard before taking your pet with you because they might not enjoy it as much as you do. Interesting, yes. 
I guess because you can't explain what's going on to an animal. They might find it a bit scary going to space. Thanks for clearing that up, Andrew. Now, Tori, while we have a communications channel kind of open with the UK Space Agency, it is, but there's a simple way to explain it. Let's with? pop over to Greenland. It's nice and snowy there, and I fancy oh, building a snowman. I think it will be right up their street. How many people have been to space before? Expert identified. Connecting. Um, can you My find name is Libby Jackson. I work for the UK Pay Space attention. Agency. Now look here. Hi, Libby. We have you two have snowmen. Just space. using powers of observation, can you tell which is the oldest? Well, one is still very round and tall. He's still got his hat on. The other one has started to melt a bit. Yep, I can see he's in a puddle of water. Obviously, the melted one is the oldest one. And you can tell because of many things, like snowmen begin to fall apart as time goes on. So, it's same inside rocks. You got it. If you were to go inside the atoms of rocks with very powerful microscopes, you'd be able to see that tiny elements, particularly uranium, have also begun to people who down. were born in Britain it's called if they went into space, decay. but they moved the to America and they went up the with NASA, so okay, they had American flags on is. their arms. But what about the there rest have of the been solar system? some space tourists, about some people who are paying to go Lumps into space. Sarah Brightman, who is a famous singer, will be going to visit the International Space Station as a space tourist next year, a little bit before Tim Peake gets there. So Tim Peake is our first government supported astronaut. He will also be our first long duration astronaut. So he's going to go and stay on the International Space Station for six months. So he'll launch at the end of November next year and then he's going to live and work in space. He's really looking forward to sharing his experience with everybody. Um, and so you should look out uh, for him on Facebook, on Twitter, on the television. He's going to be doing all sorts of things. Excellent stuff, Libby. I think I quite fancy a trip to the International Space Station myself. Captain Titori, plot a course to Earth, and we can be there in time for tea. Very good, Professor. Firing thrusters. Professor Pulsar's Space Explanation Service, with support from the UK Space Agency. Continue your space exploration at funkidslive.com slash deepspacehive. Now, have you ever wondered what life is like actually in space floating around through the big black void uh, one person who knows is a really good friend of the show tim peak he spent months on board the international space station and he stars in the brand new movie lightyear which is the Buzz Lightyear origin story. It's out in cinemas now. And he's been telling us at Fun Kids what life was like floating through the galaxy. Well, actually, on board the space station, there are things that are much, much easier, things that are much harder. And you can imagine just, you know, the harder things is it, it's the isolation, it's the, the pressure, the uh, the fact that, you know, you, you're in a high-stress environment where mistakes are not really tolerated and, um, and then things go wrong and things break. You've got to deal with emergency scenarios. But on the on the plus side of space wow you've got an amazing team on the ground who are making everything run as smoothly as possible every day on board the schedule uh, the space station has been scheduled for you and um and it's designed to be as as meticulous as possible you're, you're never ever going to live and work in an environment like that where your day job has been so well planned um and with so much support from an amazing team so there are things that are tough but there are things that have been made easier for you now you can hear more of that interview the full chat with Tim Peak on the brand new Stream It podcast where we give you all the best picks, the top tips for what you can watch at home or on the big screen in the movies. It's Stream It, the podcast which you can listen to wherever you've got this show. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. If there's anything sciencey that you want answered on this show, you need to leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. You can find us there. While you're on Apple, it's one of the best places that you can hear loads of our science series. You've heard Deep Space Eye and Professor Halleck's today. We've got loads more of them on there. We've also got podcasts about tons of other subjects, about history, about travel, about the world you can listen to them too on google spotify the free fun kids app and wherever you get your shows and fun kids we are a children's radio station from the uk you can listen all around the country on your dab digital radio and that free fun kids app 